first things first, uh, to bring everyone up to speed, IMU stands for Inertial Measurement Unit. Um, what that is, is a combination of three types of sensors. There are accelerometers, gyroscopes, and magnetometers built into each one of these sensors. Uh, these sensors are able to provide you with 3D anatomical joint angles, um, 3D accelerations, uh, as well as body segment orientations, uh, which can be extrapolated into joint trajectories within our software. Uh, some additional um, uh, benefits to this technology are they are wireless, there's, there's onboard memory, and there's synchronization between each of the sensors within our system. Uh, from an application standpoint, we're able to take this data that's combined and, and synchronized, visualize the information of the 3D kinematics, and measure those movement patterns, um, whether it's a simple range of motion test uh, or a complex movement pattern. In a, and we can do this in a variety of locations that aren't dependent on dedicated space or infrastructure. So it really starts to open up the possibilities, which is why uh, this, type, this technology is interesting in the world of biomechanics. So if we take a look at kind of what all that means in reality and visualize it, you can see here, this is an example of what kind of information you can receive from a single inertial measurement unit that's applied to a biomechanical model. So right now, uh, we're showing a video that is one sensor that's applied to the pelvis. And all we're doing is rotating it about each of the axes, which gives us the course, the pitch, and the roll of that pelvis. Um, <clears throat> So in three dimensions. And you can see that's pretty interesting even for just one sensor, is now there's a, a three-dimensional breakdown of that segment's movement. So if we take two of these sensors, what happens is we're able to create a joint. And with that joint, we not only get the individual segment orientations like we saw before, but we can actually get anatomical angles, uh, which in this case are hip flexion, hip abduction, and hip rotation. So what this is starting to tell us is, since the data is synchronized, we can look at the information coming from the pelvis and the information coming from the, the, the thigh and start to create that angle, which, which gives us um, information about that model and, and uh, kind of these anatomical angles, uh, which if you extrapolate to the full body, we can start to do some really exciting things. Uh, this is an example of someone on the ice actually skating backwards around um, center ice. So here we have seven IMU sensors and I'll play that again. Seven IMU sensors, one for each segment, and we're able to collect and visualize each one of those segments and calculate each of the anatomical angles for all six of the joints that we see here. So again, that's this is why uh, IMUs have been um, kind of an up-and-coming technology with some great advantages. Uh, it, again, it does not require any dedicated space or infrastructure. It's easily deployed as a full body motion capture system alternative to traditional uh, motion capture. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the data can be immediately utilized. It doesn't require as much pro processing since it is all onboard storage rather than um, uh, data filled and, and post-processed. Uh, we can actually provide 
real time data. So real time angular information and acceleration data, which allows for within the applied space or applied research space, a bit more biofeedback um, uh, interventions to be to be studied. And the one of the highest uh, one of the best advantages for the IMU system is uh, the elimination of data loss during wireless communication. So uh, a lot of traditional systems have occlusion issues or um, or capture volumes that um, will miss data if you go inside or outside. Um, well, with IMUs, you actually confirm the completeness of your data set by having the data stored on board and then um, ensuring that every gap is filled within your data. But there are limits. So, and that's what we are, that's what John talked about um, in the last presentation on IMUs, and that's what, we're, what the calibration adjustment tool is going to help us kind of offset and correct. So the limits on the system are the calibration position has many assumptions with it. So uh, the calibration position is the position you need to be in, you need to have your subjects be in um, for us to associate the IMU data to an anatomical position. So uh, if you cannot be in that position, then our assumption is wrong and the data is going to be um, skewed uh, in, a, in, in one direction or another. Uh, I, as John talked about last time, uh, model anthropometrics um, are assumed, so automatic scaling based off based off height can cause some issues, especially if you're using um, a generic population when your actual research population is very specific or unique. Um, those anthropometric changes are critical for uh, joint trajectories or segment velocities because of um, be, because of that uh, mechanical system. So uh, whether it's an open chain or a closed chain movement, um, we need to estimate where that limb is has traveled in space. And if our anthropometry is off, then our lever arms aren't appropriate. So that is an, another assumption. If if we if we're aiming for kind of that gold standard research uh, research grade data, and then finally in, inconsistent magnetic fields. So since one of the internal components is measuring magnetics um, to get its orientation within the world, if there's a magnetic field that skews it um, or pulls it in a certain direction, the there's a there's an opportunity for the sensor to um, produce an incorrect orientation. So with the calibration adjustment tool, um, <clears throat> we are setting out to address two of these, two of these, uh, these issues, these top issues. So the calibration position that we assume, um, we're addressing by directly uh, measuring the true orientation and position, and then the model anthropometry is, is also updated along the way. So uh, what the calibration adjustment tool is, is a combination of 3D postural data with, uh, uh, with IMU data. So what we measure is uh, the segment IMU orientation data and pair it with its true position in 3D space. So, and we'll go through the details on what the system is that we use and how it does that. The segment anthropometry is actually captured concurrently throughout that process. 
and is then applied to the model um, in the same way as the orientation and position. And on the, on the right here, you can see some of those landmarks being called out um, and, and we'll show you some, uh, some more information on um, the different landmarks we use for uh, calibration adjustment. But before we do that, we wanted to show you what this means like when it comes to data. So I'm going to restart that. If you look here, we have a subject that's city, seated in an uh, incorrect calibration position. What she should be sitting in is this initial position that you see in the middle, the skeleton holding in that knees at 90 position. And she's actually sitting in a knees, knees flared. Um, but when we apply this calibration adjustment, we can actually see the impact and, and the skeleton is snapped to her actual position. So now our data is starting from the true place um, that the subject started in, which allows us to get correct data no matter, no matter where she moves from this position. Whereas before, the kinematics would have been off by a, the factor of extension that she had in her knees during the calibration position. So that moves us into the calibration adjustment tool. This is a picture of the tool that we um, have spent time putting together. And let's go ahead and start diving in. So what does it consist of? Um, what the system includes is a Paul Hemis magnetic source, a receiver, and a pointer um, for the Paul Hemis system. This is a magnetic um, positioning system, three-dimensional positioning system. So the pointer or stylist actually is um, able to detect where it is within this 3D magnetic bubble that is produced by that source. And the reason why this works with our IMUs, um, it, it sounds a bit contradictory because it's a magnetic field, um, but the magnetic field that this specific um, source generates is below the, magnetic, below the magnitude of the magnetic field of the Earth, and it's also DC, AC, uh, it's also an AC magnetic field. So uh, whereas our sensors are looking for a, a DC magnetic field. So there, we've, we've tested a lot of systems and uh, worked through kind of the nuances of um, the positioning system. And uh, this has been uh, the one that works best uh, to quickly work with our IMUs. Uh, you also see a calibration frame that two IMUs are placed on. This calibration frame allows us to align axes. Um, uh, we'll go over that in one second. There's also two mile motion sensors which allow us to, um, to convert between the two different frames of reference of uh, the magnetic source and the inertial measurement system. Uh, and finally, uh, a non-ferrous tripod. Um, since there is uh, magnetics involved in both systems, it's very important to keep that uh, magnetic bubble as clean as possible. And so a specific tripod to use for this adjustment tool is uh, is, re is something we included within this package. So as John kind of worked through last time, um, the first step in the calibration and adjustment tool process is to align the two axes. And what that means is we need to move from the IMU measurement frame to the global coordinate frame. And um, what we what we do is we digitize 
the origin, the X and the Y axis as defined a, in this lower visual, um, <clears throat> which moves, which moves uh, the coordination or the, the uh, 3D coordinates from the IMU system and uh, and creates an offset into the three-dimensional space. So anytime we select a point and create uh, a single uh, landmark point in 3D space, we can instant, instantly trans, or transform that into um, an IMU, into the IMU space, which allows us to kind of go back and forth between the two. So um, once you calibrate the frame, then we still need to do a standard calibration of the IMUs. So selecting one of our standard calibration poses, which is either standing um, straight, like the which is which is displayed here on the right, standing with arm arms flexed to 90 degrees, or seated with arms flexed at 90 degrees, and each one of these has, again, these, these uh, calibration assumptions, which is okay, um, because that's what, that's what we'll, we'll target and correct. From uh, this calibration, we now have the opportunity to adjust any of the segments, so independently, a complete chain, the, com the complete upper body, lower body, full body um, um, model, we can, we can adjust to the real uh, position. And one critical point is between the initial calibration and this calibration adjustment, the subject needs to remain in that position. So um, in when you're working with a clinical population or a population that may have a hard time maintaining one of these positions that you calibrate in, um, finding a position that's relatively close and um, adjusting from there is uh, what we found to work the best. And we'll show you in one of the case studies uh, exactly what that means. But after the initial calibration, you select your segments that you would wish to adjust. Uh, and each segment has specific landmarks that you'll have to digitize. Um, as you select each one of the segments, a rolling list of, of these uh, landmarks will, will be built up in the background. And um, that leads us, once you're done, you'll begin to digitize each one of those landmarks. Here um, is an example of an upper body, um, an upper body uh, segment uh, adjustment. So we adjusted the upper arm, forearm, and hand, and it required a us to digitize the scapula to get the appropriate shoulder joint center. So you can see here there is there is five blue dots that represent um, anatomical landmarks um, that we needed to digitize to find that um, that joint center of the shoulder. During this segment landmark based adjustment, we'll, this would be the view that you have um, to help you ensure your data is coming out cleanly and uh, also show you kind of the point cloud that you're creating with uh, each one of the, the anatomical landmark um, markers. So. If you see on the upper left of this image, there's a, uh, there's a distortion graph 
which shows you within the magnetic field um, how accurate like its positional information is going to be. And this is really going to tell you um, kind of instabilities in your measure. So if someone is, uh, has, is, is moving too quickly or doesn't have enough time or, or, or kind of stable on a point, it'll, let, it'll inform you and, and kind of quality control um, your marking of each landmark. It'll also show you your pointer trigger channel, which is the bottom left graph. Um, a live avatar, so the actual the actual avatar that you're modifying will be visible, um, and then the point cloud uh, view. So uh, it's somewhat hard to see here, but uh, kind of the middle lower uh, window is going to is going to show a point cloud of all of the anatomical landmarks that you've that you've captured uh, thus far. Uh, and you'll start to be able to visualize and see <clears throat> how those landmarks are coming together and the, um, and the uh, segments are being defined. When you're done, uh, the system will show you kind of the results of a, your digitization, showing you joint centers, showing you um, the actual the actual segment uh, lengths and orientations relative to each other. Um, but you also, you also have the ability to modify what, what type of joint center, center model you have for um, kind of the comp more complex joints, um, primarily the hip and the shoulder. So um, the shoulder model can be a, a simple um, two marker shoulder model or a complex shoulder model, which is what we showed previously, which is a five marker or five landmark option. And then we have um, four different options for uh, the hip model for you to uh, select. And this can all be done within the software um, after you've collected your landmarks. So the f let's go ahead and get into some case studies. We have two case studies um, that we wanted to go through. Uh, John had, did, had done some repeatability studies with, within his lab. Um, we recreated one of those studies here at our headquarters. Um, what we set out to do was simplify what the calibration adjustment tool was actually um, used for. And we had a three sensor system on the subject. So we had both thighs and the pelvis activated for um, to measure uh, five, a five squat trial. What we, what we digitized was only the pelvis. So there was uh, four landmarks that we digitized, which created um, a distinct difference in, in the data. On this image here, you can see the left is going to be the adjusted record and on the right is going to be the non-adjusted record. Uh, what you'll notice is on the right everything starts around the zero mark or zero the the, the zero axis and then on the adjusted we actually have a pelvic tilt offset which is typical which is in line with what um, John was seeing when he compared uh, this process to um, his Vicon plug-in gate model. So what we see is we actually see uh, an increase in hip flexion, about 6 to 8 degrees, an increase in pelvic tilt, of, again, about 6 degrees, which those two are uh, uh, kind of complementary, and an increase in hip abduction. So 
we all of a sudden start to see information that's a bit more um, aligned with traditional uh, video or the video based marker marker or motion capture and if we look at each of the repetitions of the squat we can see that that holds true during the recording uh, during during each of the uh, each of the um, recordings and you can see here the blue line is the calibrated or the adjusted um, recording and the green line is the non-adjusted recording and if you look at that second graph there's a distinct offset that holds true throughout the entire throughout each of the reps um, and that is going to represent the pelvic tilt um, angle that we uh, that we collected so very simple um, but it already shows you know with four digitizations we were able to get a bit more true data um, on simple movements like squats. Okay, so this is uh, the second case study that we that I wanted to go through, and I'm actually going to move over to my research and and kind of show you. But just before we go over there, what we what we had the subject do was a reaching task where she was to move a stack of objects from one point to another and perform that reaching task. We digitized her upper arm, her forearm, and her hand on the right side only so that we could show uh, the effect of digitization or uh, calibration adjustment between the two sides. Um, and the key points I want you to, to look for are the relaxed posture of the patient as well as um, the kinematic improvements that you, can, uh, that you can see. So let's go ahead and go over to the recording. And what you can see here, we'll go ahead and start playing. Is our subject moving each one of the objects from the close pile to the far pile? which is interesting. He's a very fine motor control kind of a occupational therapist um, standard test that is, that, is, that is done in the applied space. This could be a pegboard test. This could be any kind of upper body fine motor control test. But if we now go to the model, we can see the digitized shoulder here in the point cloud. We can see this is the digitized um, an or orientation of the hand, the forearm, and then the, uh, the shoulder here. And what we can do is We can show the original. Which if you take a look at the if you take a look at the left side of this avatar, you can see her hand is actually resting on her thigh, where the assumed calibration places her hand in this 90 degree orientation. 
with the calibration adjustment, we can actually, it actually modifies that calibration to be resting on her knee so that when she does move, it is in the actual orientation and, um, and, and more true kinematics to the task that she's completing. So this is, a, this is an example of what you can see um, and expect from an upper body calibration and kind of the impact of how we can use these modifications to create a more relaxed pose for the subjects or get more true kinematics. So that is everything I had today. Thank you for joining. And I